This is Photographing the West Podcast, the podcast for people who love to explore the western highways and byways while photographing the landscape and wildlife. And now here's your host, Kirby Flanagan. Hello, and welcome to episode number 56 of the Photographing the West Podcast. This episode is brought to you by Photo Tees a company that brings you beautiful nature and wildlife photography on t-shirts and sweatshirts using original designs. Check them out at www.flanaganphotos.com. My guest today is well-known photographer, Jim Zuckerman. Jim is one of those rare photographers who makes stunning images in a wide variety of genres, including wildlife, people, architecture, and landscape photography, to name a few. Plus, he's a Photoshop guru besides. Welcome to Photographing the West, Jim. Thank you very much, Kirby. Glad to have you aboard. So who is Jim Zuckerman as a person and as a photographer? I see myself as just a guy with a camera and a guy with a computer. Being a photographer, it's, it's sort of a solitary existence. You don't go to an office and have a team working with you. You're out there by yourself, really. Uh, if I'm leading a photography tour, then I have uh, students with me. But for many, many years, it was just me and a camera. And then when computers became fast enough and Photoshop became online, it was me and a computer. And um, I work in my office. I create images and I send them out. And the market does the rest. Uh, and now, of course, we have social media, so, you know, your name can get out there expansively. But um, I, I just uh, love creating beauty. That's my motivation. And I guess that's why I can't constrain myself to one kind of photography, because there's so many kinds of beauty out there. Very true, but not all of us capture it as well as you do. Well, thank you. You do everything you do by yourself? You don't have a staff or anything? No, uh, my wife uh, works with me in our photography tour business, but um, in terms of the photography, it's just me. Okay, that's pretty amazing in itself. I, I was looking at your easing, and uh, it's uh, beautifully done and must have required a lot of work, I would have thought. It, it does require a lot of work. Uh, the e magazine is how I promote myself. Um, I've always believed that you you give something to get something back, and so that's why I don't charge for it. It's free, comes out every month, and you know it's a challenge to come up with new ideas to write about because I've been doing this for many years. Um, but uh, I I really like it because it gives me total control. I mean, there's so many times when I would in the past when I was making money writing for magazines or selling pictures to magazines. So often they would use pictures that weren't necessarily my favorites, or they put their text all over it and sort of ruin the pictures. But now this is mine, and so I can do whatever I want. And so uh, I choose the covers, I choose everything. And and so it's it's a creative outlet. Yes, it's definitely a lot of work. Uh, there's there's so much behind the scenes work in making all the links work and coming up with the ideas and choosing the pictures. Um, but I enjoy it. I get a lot of positive feedback from it, and people tell me all the time how much they enjoy it, how much they learn. So it's gratifying. Yeah, I would have to say that uh, it uh, you produce more good material than a lot of uh, e-zines that you have to pay for. So um, well done, I would say. Well, thanks very much for that compliment. I appreciate it. Well, you work in multiple genres. Uh, which one do you like the best and which one do you find the most challenging? I would have to say to both of those, wildlife. You know, there's there's nothing as exciting to me, at least, in, in looking through your camera and seeing a spectacular animal uh, in a great pose. It's challenging in lots of ways. Uh, just you know, as you get older, your equipment gets heavier, it seems, and yet you need those long lenses. So it's challenging physically. Uh, you have to have endless patience waiting for something to happen. And everything has to come together just right. The lighting, the pose, the focus. Um, if it's birds in flight, 
that's really challenging. I've been doing that in the last several years when the equipment has gotten good enough for that. And it, it's just unbelievably exciting. But, you know, people see my pictures in the e-magazine and, and in, my, in my books. What they don't see are all the pictures I missed. Everybody forgets that. Yeah. You know, I, I can show pretty picture after pretty picture, but like I said, the ones you're not seeing are the ones that got away. That uh, I, I wasn't in focus. I wasn't fast enough. The lighting was bad. The background was busy. Uh, you know, all kinds of things just uh, didn't go right. And so it, it's the most challenging, but definitely the most rewarding for me. Uh, for me as well. So I, I really enjoy your uh, wildlife ph photographs. So, so how has your approach to wildlife evolved over the years and why would you say? Well, for, t for 25 years, I shot medium format film, the Mamiya RZ67. Um, I did that when I was shooting stock photography because I felt the larger transparencies gave me a competitive edge. Everybody knows that larger transparencies reproduce better in books and magazines and posters and jigsaw puzzles and so on. And so I shot everything with that camera and I did more with that camera, I think, than anybody. And I did wildlife with it as well. But think about this. It was a manual camera. Focus was manual. Exposure was manual. I had to cock the, the shutter to advance the frame of film. And, and so um, it was, I got good pictures, but, but as soon as I went digital in 2005 with, with a Canon, the, at the time, the 1D, uh, sorry, sorry, the 1DS Mark II, it was eight thousand dollars, and uh, in you know by today's standards, it just was way too noisy and and so on. But but compared to what I was used to, freed me up to be able to capture animals in action, birds in flight. So it's, it's totally changed my ability to capture amazing images. Uh, I I tried to do some birds in flight with this with that film camera, but the top end shutter speed was a 400th of a second, way too slow for a bird in flight. I'd get blurred images and think, well, okay, we'll call this an artistic blur. But <laughs> now, yeah, I know. But now, you know, um, my standard shutter speed for birds in flight is 32 hundredth of a second. And I get tack sharp images, even the tips of the wings. So right. it's, it's a whole new approach now. Yeah, I can't imagine trying to do wildlife photography, let alone uh, birds in flight with a four by five camera. It had to be amazingly challenging. Well, it wasn't four by five, it was six by seven. Oh, okay. Six by seven centimeter, or that translates to two and a quarter by two and three quarter inches, medium format, not large. Oh, okay. But, but even so. But, but yeah, even so, it was it was very, very difficult and and but but you know when I, I used to mount those transparencies in glass, and I had a special projector that projected medium format, and if I were giving a slideshow along with other photographers, nobody wanted to follow me because they were all shooting 35 millimeter, and that their pictures looked, you, you know, just unimpressive next to mine because mine were so sharp, but they could get images that I couldn't see be, because. Right because they had the, the autofocus and the, you know, multiple frames per second, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, I've seen uh, those type of images uh, years ago and uh, the amount of detail in them is just uh, unbelievable. Yes, yes, that, that's why I, I sort of suffered for my art with that, that big camera. Right. You're very creative in your approach to photography and like to break the boundaries or, or quote unquote rules of the photo real photography. Talk about your approach to Photoshop and your Photoshop workflow. Well, you know, I, I tell people who travel with me and people who take my, my classes and workshops, you have to decide if you are a photo journalist or a photo artist, a photo journalist 
is a purist. You know, not supposed to change anything. Uh, and, and that's, there are people like that and that's fine, but that's not me. I've always thought of myself as a photo artist and as such, I can do whatever I want with my, with my images. And if people think, well, you shouldn't manipulate a wildlife shot or a nature shot, those are rules they play by. It's not rules that I play by. My approach is I can do whatever I want to make my pictures perfect or to make my pictures uh, artistic in a way that pleases me. When I first got Photoshop in, in the very early 1990s, one of the first images that I wanted to do, I wanted to take a model of a dinosaur and put it into a landscape. Because as a wildlife photographer, I, I admit that I'm frustrated that I'll never be able to photograph a T-Rex or a Stegosaurus. And it's, it's frustrating because, I mean, how awesome would that be? you know, to photograph a, a, some huge dinosaur, but I can't do it. So I put, I put it together. I, I bought a very uh, expensive model, had it airbrushed. This was back in about 94. And then I put it into uh, the Amazon river and I sat back in my chair and I, and I went, wow, that's incredible. And a actually that turned out to be my second best selling picture of all time in my stock agency. You know, um, if, if a background is busy behind a bird or an animal, uh, I have no qualms in, in changing it and making it perfect. And I've, I've been doing something the last uh, two, three years that, that I, I, th I find quite compelling. You know, when you use a telephoto lens to photograph an animal or a bird, the background is always out of focus. Uh, even if you use F16 or 22 with a 500, the background may be recognizable and defined, but it's not going to be sharp. But when you look at the animal in the scene with your eyes, everything is sharp. We do not see shallow depth of field with our eyes ever. So I started putting pictures together where you have a telephoto shot of an animal and the background is sharp because I replace it. And I, I think it's a, a very dramatic way to uh, render a scene because it's, it's akin to what we can see, but, you know, our lenses are a man-made construct. Uh, we have shallow depth of field with telephoto lenses and we don't have that with our eyes. So in a sense, I'm really photographing and creating something that we see, not, not that what, you know, we're limited to by our lenses. So, uh, I, I do break boundaries and uh, because, like I said, I consider myself a photo artist first and not a photojournalist. So when you do that, do you use the same background you're looking at or, or bring in a different background or some of each? It, it could be either. Um, I, just did a, I just posted a picture on Facebook yesterday. Uh, I was leading a photography tour to the Grand Tetons in Yellowstone in, in winter. It was a really beautiful time to photograph those places. And, and the number one shot that I wanted out of Yellowstone was a, a snow-covered bison. If you photograph bison in the summer, they're just like a brown hulk. But in the winter, when they're covered in snow, it's really cool. And, of course, I'm using a long lens, and the, the background's out of focus. So I just... Um, I, I move, move my camera like, you know, two or three degrees, photographed the, the trees behind it with my long lens sharp, and then I put them together. And I think it's, it's awesome. Um, it takes Photoshop skill to do that, especially with hair and fur of, of animals, but it's doable. And, uh, and you know, other times I'll, I'll create a, a completely different background, a one that I wish were there, but, but you know, it didn't happen. So if both the uh, foreground and the background are sharp, uh, how do you uh, make the uh, animal stand out from the background or do you? Well, um, it stands out just because it's, it's in the foreground. Okay. Uh, you, know, you, you have to match the lighting, obviously. Uh, you, you can't put a, a picture of an animal that was taken at sunrise against a picture of a background that was taken at noon. Just, you know, 
it's going to sure. look ridiculous. Um, but um, and and also also something that's often overlooked, you have to have complete depth of field on the animal. In other words, if the head and shoulders are sharp, but the rear end of the animal is a bit blurred, and then you put that in front of a sharp background, that's impossible. You see, you can't go from sharp to soft to sharp again. Sure. So, so you have to think about things like that, um, and the perspective has to work. So you can't just put any old animal in front of any old background. You have to really think about it. But it's it's a really dramatic way to uh, show wildlife and, and and birds as well. You virtually never see a picture of a bird with a uh, landscape sharp behind it. Birds are small. You want to use a long lens. And by definition, the background's soft. But if you put a flying bird against a sharp, let's say, jungle foliage, it's a different look. I find it very compelling and uh, artistic. Yeah. So how long does it take you to do that? Well, it depends upon the, su the subject. If, if it's a, let's say, a snowy owl, white bird photographed against a blue sky, you can separate that in five or 10 seconds. If it's a bison fringed with, with detail in the hair, uh, that's a different story. If the bison's photographed against white snowy background, not so hard. If the bison is photographed against a forest, then that's a much different situation. So it all depends upon basically the contrast between the subject and its original background. The, the greater the contrast, the easier it is to separate. The, the, the lesser the contrast, the, the more challenging it is. So do you use one of the Photoshop tools to uh, uh, separate the subject from the background? Well, th there's, I guess, basically three tools that I use. Um, if we have a nice, clean separation, like my example of a snowy owl against the blue sky, you can use the quick selection tool. That's very easy. If it's a little more challenging, then I may use the pen tool, which is laborious, but, it's, but the most accurate way to separate something. And then if there's hair, then I would use Topaz Remask 5. It's the best tool we have for separating uh, a subject with hair from its background. OK. I know of Topaz, but I haven't really used it, so uh, that's good to know. So you sent me uh, two wildlife photos that are composites, uh, which I'll put in the show notes. Uh, one is a photo of a polar bear and another of a leopard climbing down a tree. Uh, right. Well, uh, talk about how you did those and the reason that you did those and uh, how you achieved that look. Looked at both of them and uh, I couldn't certainly couldn't have told you that they were composites. Well, I appreciate that. That's obviously the goal. The, the polar bear was photographed against with with Hudson Bay in the background. And I used a 500, and like I was talking about, the back, the the the, the bay itself was blurred. And good-looking picture, I liked it. But given my thoughts about this kind of compositing, at the time I was there, I took a picture of the bay with with this, the the same lens, focused on the bay and the clouds, and then I put them together, and that's what I saw. The out of focus background, of course, like I said, was a man made construct because we don't see out of focus backgrounds behind our subjects. And so when I put the two pictures side by side, I, I much prefer the one I sent you where you can see complete depth of field. And the, the, the leopard shot was on my very first trip to Africa. I'd never photographed a leopard in the wild before, and it was, it was sleeping in a tree. And I, it was just me and the driver. I was not doing a tour then. And we sat there literally for four hours waiting for that leopard to do something. And finally, it sat up, yawned, and climbed down the tree. And I, was, I shot that with my, my medium format uh, film camera at the time. 
But the problem was that the tree was very, very busy. The background was horrible. And so I replaced it with a, with a landscape from Africa, uh, taken actually several years later. And uh, I put that in just because it's, it's uh, such a, an interesting kind of perspective. It, it's one that you just don't see because of the limitations of optics. And, and with the leopard picture, I, I separated that with a pen tool just to be ultra precise. With the polar bear, I used Topaz Remask 5 because of the uh, of that fine hair around the edge of the animal. Going back to the polar bear for a moment, uh, the polar bear is really large in the foreground. Uh, That's were right. That, were you that close or is that some Photoshop work? No. I, uh, that. That's full frame. The situation was uh, my photography tour group and I were in a, a compound with a, a dining room and, and, and the small rooms uh, where we stayed. And our compound was surrounded by electrified wire uh, fencing. And uh, the polar bears were outside of our compound and they were free. So they would walk past our compound at the edge of Hudson Bay there, waiting for the pack ice to form so they could go hunt seals. This this bear was taken with a 500, but uh, other bears would walk, I mean, 10 feet up to our fence. We had two uh, local Inuit men who had uh, uh, rifles with rubber bullets. And if the bears got too close, they'd shoot them in the rear with the rubber bullet just to scare them because you don't want interactions with bears and people it's bad for everybody especially, especially polar bears well yeah yeah because if they hurt somebody they're going to kill the bear and nobody wants that and and so so the sound of the gun and the sting of the rubber bullet on their rear end scares them and they 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 take off but but i i got a couple of shots i didn't i didn't send it to you but i have a couple of shots where i'm actually laying on the ground looking up at the bear about about 12, 15 feet away with a, a 70 to 200. You know, in terms of bears, the polar bears, most people go out there on those tundra buggies, but they're very high. Uh, they're at least 15 feet off the ground, and that means that you're shooting down on the bears. And I think that perspective is horrible. The lower you get, even with a big animal like an elephant or a giraffe, the lower you get, the greater the stature of the animal uh, is. And so uh, the reason why the bear looks so impressive is because I'm kneeling on the ground, you know, at eye level or below eye level to, to give the bear that really impressive look. And I, I think it's the only way to shoot animals with, with few exceptions. Well, it's certainly an impressive photo. Uh, I can't imagine uh, the experience of being 15 foot from a polar bear and uh, having them look you right in the eye. Well, it, it was um, it sort of took your breath away. No doubt. Well, to change subjects a bit, uh, you've been an author for many years. You have books uh, that were published, and uh, now you're into ebooks and online courses and your blog. So, talk about that transition and how you keep up with all these publications. Well, I work all the time. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I I allow myself uh, usually one movie a night with my wife uh, before we go to bed. But other than that, I'm working. I, I've written 15 books in print, and then when uh, the internet came online and and uh, ebooks became possible, I I much prefer writing the ebooks. I I just finished my my. 11th ebook. This one's on wildlife photography. It's being edited right now by somebody who makes sure that there's no mistakes in it. When when you sign a contract with a publisher to to uh, produce a book, uh, from the time you sign the contract until the time you ha are holding the book in your hands, it's two years. They give you one year to write it, and it takes them about one year to put it together, to edit, to lay it out to get the uh, sample of, of pages printed in overseas and then shipped to America. It's about two years. 
when I write an ebook, you know, I can, it, all the information's in my head. So it usually takes me maybe two weeks and, and then it's done. Um, and when you, when you uh, write a, a book in print, it's going to be about $30 and the, and the author gets um, about 10% of wholesale. So if the wholesale is $15, I get about a dollar and a half a book. With an ebook, I can sell it for a third of the price, $10, and I get all of it, uh, minus whatever PayPal takes, about 45 cents. So it, it's, a, it's a better deal for me, and I've got total control, and I don't have to wait two years, and I don't have to get a, you know, approval from uh, an editorial committee. I just, if I want to do something, I do it. And so, so I, I enjoy that a lot. Um, I'm, I'm active on social media because it helps promote my photography tours and my, my publications. I'm on Facebook, uh, Instagram, LinkedIn. Uh, that's about all I can handle. And, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> so yeah, you know, in, in a way the internet destroyed a lot of, uh, photographers and their businesses, stock photography, just crashed and burned. But the internet also allows you to promote yourself for, in many ways, for free. You know, I, I post on Facebook and it goes, to, I've got, you know, 5,000 of my closest friends on Facebook follow me. And on Instagram, I have over 11,000 of my closest friends who follow me. And that's all free. And so, and and I send out my email, my e-magazine. It cost me just a a few dollars for it to be hosted and, and my mailing list to be hosted in the past. If you wanted to advertise your photo tours in a magazine, gosh, it was just thousands of dollars. So, uh, that's why I'm active because it, it promotes me. Sure. So the, the eBooks, are you self publishing those then or? Yes, I'm self publishing them. What software do you use? I'm using uh, InDesign. It's it's a, a Adobe product, right? And um, it's it's not user friendly at all. So I I went online and I I subscribed to Lynda.com uh, for two months and they taught me how to use it. How about the online courses? Uh, apparently, you self publish those as well. What software do you like for that? Oh, uh, those are just on my website. There's no software. Um, I, I used to teach for a company called betterphoto.com. I did that for 13 years along with many other photographers and, and they, they had some proprietary software, but on my own website, um, it's just listed. And when people sign up, I send them all the lenses in a PDF format. And then they send me, uh, their pictures per the lessons and I critique them. Okay. They're not video courses. They're no, they're they're text and and uh, pictures in a PDF file. Oh, okay, I see. Blogging. I assume you're using Word or something similar. Yeah, just just a Word document, and then I just paste that into like the Facebook page or Instagram. You obviously like to teach. We've kind of talked about your ease on. E zine that is, and uh, your online courses and blog. Uh, I assume you do a lot of teaching on your uh, tours and workshops as well. Talk about that a bit. Yeah, people come on my photography tours and workshops to learn, and that's what I do. I, I teach. I've been teaching photography for a very long time. I enjoy it. Um, I enjoy uh, seeing people take great pictures and, and get excited about it. And you know, on photography tours, we we really inspire each other. Um, sometimes they'll see something that I missed, or or vice versa. And so, you know, I'll show them the back of my camera, and I'll you know say consider using a a wide angle lens up close type of composition. They go, yeah, I didn't think about that. And then th they might capture something that I hadn't noticed, and I go, wow, that's fantastic. And then you know, I want to get it. So it, it we we sort of feed off each other, but. I've been teaching so long that people really come away uh, learning a lot about all kinds of aspects of photography because I do everything. 
off-camera flash, uh, composition, different different lighting uh, styles. They, they they learn all kinds of stuff on my trips. So are you doing everything hands-on in the field, or you or you have classroom classes, or how does that work? Both. My my photography tours are in the field, obviously. I teach Photoshop. Uh, twice a year uh, in my home. I've got a classroom and people come here from all over the country and spend a weekend here and, and they go home with a head full of ideas. I do a, a twice a year, a frog and reptile workshop in St. Louis, uh, where we have about uh, 40 to 50 species of really unique creatures. It's basically a macro workshop and we use a ring flash or twin macro flash setup for that. And so uh, that's that's actually done in a, in a conference room. I mean, it's, the, the hotel has gotten used to me now, but in the beginning they were a little bit uncertain because we have snakes and poison dart frogs and chameleons and geckos and all kinds of cool stuff. But uh, now every time I have a workshop, the staff comes in and sees what we're doing and enjoys it. But most of the stuff I do is in the field you know, like a photography tour to uh, Venice, Italy for carnival or the Pantanel in Brazil or festival in Indonesia. We, we're there and we're photographing these amazing things. Yeah, I've seen some of those. They're amazing. So you've been in the photography business for about 45 years now. Uh, what lessons have you learned about this uh, increasingly competitive and difficult business? Well, when I started, it was competitive, of course, but nothing like today. You know, what, what's happened, um, the, the whole photography business has changed in the, over the last 10 to 15 years. The internet is largely responsible for that, and, and digital photography is responsible for that. In the beginning, when we shot film, you had to know what you're doing because if you did a, a shoot of a model or you were in in Europe do, doing a, a, a photography shoot for your stock photo agency, you didn't see the results on the back of your camera. You only saw the results when you got film developed. And if your exposure was wrong or your, your focus was off or the lighting was off, it's, it's too late. You know, you're not going to go f fly back to Europe and do it all again. So you had to know what you're doing. Now with digital cameras, you look on the back of it, and if it's wrong, you just change what you're doing and make it right. You know, and iPhones now are good enough to, to have pictures published. So millions of people, literally millions of people who love traveling and love shooting, they they said to themselves, well, maybe I can make a little extra money with my camera and pay for my vacation. And so people who have good jobs, doctors, lawyers, teachers, uh, businessmen, they, they, they may not need the money, but they submit their pictures to stock agencies anyway. And, you know, suddenly the whole agency thing was flooded with millions of pictures. And so... Uh, the amount of money that people would pay for stock pictures, uh, specifically uh, royalty-free pictures, the prices plummeted. The percent the agencies paid the photographers was reduced significantly. So there just was no more money in it. And, and uh, you know, I and many other photographers made their living with stock photography for decades it, but and it just ended. So now, the only way to make a living, uh, un unless you you're in the rarefied few who found a, a unique niche, the only way is to do workshops and tours. Uh, a few well-known photographers, like T like Tom Mengelson, you know, has a gallery or several galleries. Peter Lick has a few galleries and they, they do very well, but that's a, it's a hard business and, uh, but it's, it's doable. And there's a few people who still make money in commercial photography. 
I shared a workshop years ago in New York with a guy who had just come off of a Nike shoot. Uh, it was a 10 day shoot and he was getting $20,000 a day. That's a lot of money. Now from that, he had to pay makeup people and lighting people and camera assistants and catering, a catering crew and the models. And so he had expenses, but, but still, you know, it, it's a high pressure kind of a thing in photography. And there's a few guys who do it well, you know, car photographers, you know, Ford comes out with their 2020 line and somebody has to photograph those cars and they get a lot of money for that. But it's very difficult to get those positions. And so it, so photography today is very tough. If I were talking to a young person, I would dissuade them, to be honest, from going into this field unless they were just really highly motivated and really wanted to be successful. There's always room for one more, but you really have to want it. Don't quit your day job. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, yes. Anything is doable. If, if you if you come up with a good idea, you know, a few years ago, a guy came up with this brilliant idea of photographing dogs diving into a pool. I'm sure you've seen those pictures. Um, he, he got an underwater camera. Somebody would throw a ball in the pool and a dog would jump in after it and, and he would use flash to get this wide eyed expression on the dog and his pictures went viral. And, uh, and I know this because of, uh, uh, one of my best friends is a good friend of his. Eight different publishers were vying for the rights to publish his first book. He got like a $200,000 advance on his first book. And wow. you know, since then, he's, he's come out with other books. He's, he's made a fortune because he had a phenomenal idea of, of photographing dogs in these outrageous comedic uh, expressions as they're diving into a pool after a ball, <laughs> you know, who, who would have thought, but, but he's done extremely well because he had a great idea and he did it really, really well. So there's always room for one more, but, but it's hard. Yeah, for sure. Have you uh, done anything with video? No, I never have. I, I really appreciate it. My camera can shoot video. You know, I love videos from drones. And, and uh, so some people on my tours do, do videos. And this one lady got this amazing video of, of, a, of a, a herd of hippos. I don't know if that's the right word, herd, using for hippos. But there had to be 30 or 40 of them running across the road right in front of her vehicle. And she got a wonderful video. But I just, I'm so focused on getting the still pictures that I just, I don't, invest the time in, in the video uh, realm. Right. Only so many hours in the day. That's true. Yep. Any other advice for uh, newcomers in the field other than uh, don't quit your day job? <laughs> well, you know, a lot of people have, have a love of photography and image making and travel and, um, I've had it all my life. F photography can lead you into a lot of wonderful places. You don't have to focus on making money with it. You can't, you can, but um, photography can, can lead you into uh, great areas of the world, pursuing animals. It can lead you into the, the macro realm. I know people who do nothing but photograph insects and it, that's a whole incredible world. Um, you can photograph beautiful women. Uh, uh, there, there's a Russian photographer. I've seen his work online and, and he, he's done a whole uh, collection of images, spectacular stuff of little children and big dogs. It's, it's the, the, the sweetest thing where he'll take like a, a four-year-old little girl and dress her up in a, in, in a winter hat, you know, a furry winter hat and a cute little coat and photograph her standing next to a St. Bernard that, you know, is a head taller than she is. Mm. And, and so there's just all kinds of styles and subjects uh, where photography can lead you. And so my advice would just be, to, if you have to do it, 
then then do it. Then then uh, devote your energies to that, and it's tremendously rewarding. Um, even if you never sell a picture, just just to create the images, share them online, uh, on a website, on Facebook, get feedback. Um, you know, get ideas of of places to go, and people get inspired by your pictures. It's it's just a wonderful uh, pursuit. Indeed, it teaches you to see the world in a different way uh, and in a unique way, hopefully. It does. I, I always tell people that photography taught me to see. I mean, before photography, I, I didn't have the, the kind of visual sense I do now. I, I remember when I was 15, uh, which is five years before I bought my first camera, first serious camera, um, I was at a friend of mine's house, a friend of our family. He was 27 trying to make it in portrait photography. And he showed me 11 by 14 black and white print of a, of a little boy. And he said to me, what's wrong with this picture? I looked at it and it looked like a cute little boy to me and I didn't see anything wrong with it. And then he started to point out, you know, this shadow shouldn't be there and something in the background was distracting. I hadn't seen it. Of course, I was only 15. But now, of course, you know, my visual sense is acute and I see things very readily. And so that's why I tell people photography has taught me to really see things and appreciate them. Well, before we go, uh, where can people find you, your photographs, your tours, your publications, and all those things you do? Um, well, everything is uh, available through my website, uh, jimzuckerman.com. Uh, at the bottom of the homepage, they can subscribe uh, to my free e-magazine. And then uh, there's a, a listing of my photography tours and uh, portfolios of my work. Okay, sounds good. Well, thanks for being on Photographing the West podcast, Jim. It's been uh, both educational and fun. Each episode, along with show notes and photos, can be found at www.flanagan, F L A N A G A N, photos, spelled F O T O S, dot com. Thanks for listening, and we'll talk soon. Thanks for listening to Photographing the West podcast. Please subscribe to the podcast in iTunes and leave us a review. Till next time, here's wishing you safe travels and good light. <laughs>